other are, are presenters okay. here? Yes, are... the presenters are here. So um you can go ahead and um and start the meeting. And okay. Then... Good evening, everyone. As you can see, I'm Annette Robinson, co-chair with Heather. I thank all of you for coming out tonight. We have committee members here uh, that are. Could you just, uh, you guys spoke. Do you just want to introduce yourself real briefly and we'll move ahead with announcements, keeping uh, the agencies to uh, five minutes? Hey, Poo, you want to start it off? Who you hey, are? Uh, yeah. Hey, y'all. April Adams, uh, Community Ward 9. Thanks for being here. Pass it off to the next person, please. Um, I pass it to Liz. Mm, thanks, April. And thanks, Annette. Uh, Liz Waitakis, Community Board 9. I live in an HDFC on Convent Avenue. And uh, I do historic preservation. So thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. Uh, and I am passing it to, uh, who else did we say was here? I'm just I looking believe at the she said Alyssa is here. Alyssa. Alyssa. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. And we look forward to your presentation. Okay. Is that it, Heather? Yes, that's that's it. Okay, let's move forward with park announcements and updates. And at the top, we have Leslie Wright from Denny Farrell Riverbank State Park. Is she in attendance? Yes, she yes, is I here. And, and and I'll just say that we 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 call the meeting to order at six thirty five p.m. Um, we all, um, I guess, do we have a quorum or do we? I guess we currently probably don't have a quorum. I believe we need Ms. Caldwell. Okay. So we'll 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 go ahead then with go ahead, Annette, then with Can Ms. I, Wright. Before we move forward, um, I just have a question on the agenda. Okay. Um, when would you like me to talk about 451 Convent Avenue? If we have you on the agenda at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, hold, any... Liz, we holding you hostage. You can't get away, <laughs> boo. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's all fine. I'm, he I'm here for the long haul. <laughs> all righty. Leslie Wright? Yes, good evening. Thank you so much um, for uh, having me at this meeting on behalf of New York State Parks. I'm delighted to talk about Denny Farrell Riverbank State Park. This Saturday is the monthly friends meeting. Saturday, uh, 10.30 kickoff till noon in the main building, second floor rehearsal room B. All are absolutely welcome. Uh, the friends meetings go through every department, reports, programs, uh, ongoing events, ongoing capital projects, ideas, suggestions, feedback. So please, um, it's always the second Saturday of every month. You're, everyone's entirely welcome, and we're, we're always eager to have new folks show up and share their ideas and thoughts. Uh, the park is full steam ahead. We had a really successful program um, uh, production last late last month, The Meeting, a uh, fictional meeting between Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King. We had over, I think, 400 people in our theater on a Saturday afternoon. It was terrific. We're trying to up all of our, our programming in the theater in particular. So we've been sharing flyers with Yutha to post on the community board's website. Also, uh, all of the programs are posted on the park's Instagram. It's still ice skating this season. Uh, maybe actually with this week's rain, we're going to lose our ice, but so far so good. We're scheduled to go through the month of March. Figure Skating of Harlem will have its annual show mid-month, March 17th. Again, that'll be posted on the park's website, Instagram, and flyers throughout the park. Um, and so much more in the programming department. I, I just really encourage you all to, to take a look at, at our social media and, and see it all and be able to capture it that way. Happy to report that the renovation of the aquatics locker room 
remain still on track. We will open those brand spanking new locker rooms early in June for everyone to enjoy. Um, we have a few big capital projects gearing up to start early in the fall. We've talked about them at, at previous meetings. They remain on track. The north stair tower and elevator going down to the parking lot. Um, and also the uh, filter room for the main aquatic center. So more details and schedule information on those two big projects to come. I also want to alert everyone, finally, we're having a um, virtual public meeting and feedback session on April 10th in the evening, 6 to 8 p.m. I'll distribute flyers. It'll be on our social media to get feedback on proposed renovations at the south end of the park where the um, baseball softball field is, the tennis courts, the playground. We're, we're not changing any of the programming there, but we're doing a substantial refresh of all the different features, um, including lighting and signage, and want to get uh, as much public input in that as possible. So again, we'll post the flyers with the, with Yutha, and um, thank you for that service, Yutha. Really appreciate it. And uh, if there's a minute left, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Okay, I'm encouraged. You have a whole two minutes left. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Are there any questions? Sure. <laughs> Heather, okay, I see my two minutes. <laughs> um, I'll just go ahead and just remind everyone again, if you haven't already signed into the chat, um, if you could please kindly do so. And Alyssa, please, um, your camera is, is not on. Um, Something could be blocking your, it, it appears as if something's blocking your camera view. And if there is a volunteer from our committee to take the minutes for this month, could you please let me know that you're willing to volunteer? Okay. Moving along, thank you again, Leslie. We are going to Mallory Craig. The Greenhouse and Community Garden at River Bank. Uh, Mallory is there. I see you. Hi, Mallory. Hi there. Good evening. Um, I'm joining you from a very cozy, rainy greenhouse this evening. <laughs> where we're having our um, recipes and rituals for community care class, which is still going on every Wednesday. And I would love for you to attend. Leslie, thank you for mentioning um, yeah, the greenhouse events and all of our free and open to the public uh, programs are now, and Yutha, thank you so much, are now um, being directed to Yutha. So in addition to the Hort.org, where you can find um, and sign up for all the free events um, and programs, weekly sessions, uh, it'll also be on the community board website. Um, and so, yeah, today we're making some... Um, uh, we're making some make and takes for uh, mobile apothecary that we're creating with um, uh, that we have uh, slated to be shared out in April for a few uh, several events that we have going on. Um, we have our water conservation festival and Earth Day event on April Saturday, April 20th and our seed celebration in early April and that date is so close to being determined we're just relying on when we get our seed donations because in the beginning of April we'll be able to give a bunch of seed and plant giveaways um, so again that uh, when we have that um, date hold it for early April um, but we'll certainly forward that info and you can find it on our website as well um, tomorrow come and join us as well we have our, um, our usual art classes our 5 p.m. art in the garden, 6.30 art in agriculture. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, the normal classes that I share about each week, uh, this Saturday, Family Pharmacy come through, uh, family, family generously, interpreted, generously Interpreted. The greenhouse right now is in full seed starting production mode. So I'm looking at a bunch of seeds that are gonna be going out into our learning garden. We're gonna be doing that more with families this Saturday. Um, and two more programs that I just, again, um, they're on the website and I believe on the CB9 website now as well. Um, we have some specialty programs that are happening during the day. Um, just for the month of March, while some of our educators are 
um, away from their after school sites, um, which they'll be returning to in April, but come and join us um, for uh, some gifting the garden in which we learn some gardening skills while also thinking about reciprocity in the garden and how we can um, make things that the garden provides while also giving back to the garden and learning urban gardening skills. And that will happen on Thursday at, um, every Thursday at 3.30 throughout the month of March, um, 3.30 to five. And then every Tuesday, um, in addition to our art in the garden class um, on Thursdays at five, we have a Tuesday three o'clock uh, botanical arts, um, which is getting into the art and science of botanical arts. So come and join us on that day as well. Again, all those events are on our website. Um, happy to leave that link in the chat. Um, and otherwise, yeah, very excited to getting the seeds starting with you for you all and with you all come to the greenhouse if you just want to breathe in the beautiful air that um, is of seed starting. We're oh, open seven days a week. Thank you, Mallory. It must be something in the water at Riverbank. You and Leslie are keeping it under. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all of that information. Are there questions? Heather? I don't see any questions. I don't see any hands raised right now. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Well, that was very thorough, Mallory, as usual. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, um, Green Thumb will not be speaking tonight, so we're going to move along to uh, Riverside Park and West Harlem Piers Park. Is Wesley here tonight, Heather? Hi, Wesley. How are you? Good. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Oh, oh great. Sometimes I've known to have some technical difficulties. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. My name is Wesley Hamilton. I'm the park manager for Riverside Park and West Harlem Piers. And um, uh, one update that we're happy to share, we've mentioned it before, but we're um, uh, 142 Dog um, dog Park is moving out of the design and procurement phase and into the construction phase. So we look forward to that project beginning and um, we expect that to begin this month. So for, for those uh, in the community that uh, are familiar with that, uh, you'll be reaching out to... Um, Stephanie, our uh, Riverside Park Conservancy volunteer, will, will also be coordinating some um, some plans to kind of wrap up the old uh, dog park so we can uh, clear that out and get it ready for the new dog park that's uh, uh, hopefully be here very soon now that it's starting. Uh, the, the other news that we might have, I don't have a lot of details about it, but we had mentioned in uh, last month that unfortunately we had to close off uh, the stairs at 148, uh, which that still is the case. But we did meet with DOT, and uh, we originally, we, before we had met with DOT, we believed it was going to be a long-term project. Uh, but we're going to be working closely with DOT, and we're hoping to get that, those stairs fixed and open sooner rather than later. So, again, unfortunately, I don't have any new time frames or, or deadlines at this time. But uh, just wanted to reassure the community that um, we're making that a priority, and we're working closely with DOT to make to make to get that staircase open quicker, as quickly as possible. Uh, with that being said, if anybody's got any questions for me, I'd be happy to try to answer them or or look into them for you and get back to you if there's anything I don't know. Thank you so much, Wesley. Do we have questions? Any questions for Wesley? Shannon, do you have any questions for Wesley? No, my heart can't take it. If I get started, <laughs> y'all will never get me shut up. So I will, oh, no, I'll just no. jump in to say it's been, a, it's, it's been a voyage. We've got a lot of people to thank, parks, the Conservancy, Community Board 9, et cetera. So uh, we're excited and we're going to have to learn how to behave ourselves while we're under construction and don't have a dog run to release the dogs. Um, but we're very excited. So thank All you right, much. Shannon. Thank you. I'm encouraged. You made that free. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Moving along, we have Stephanie Caban, Riverside Park Conservancy. Heather hey, is... hello. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. How are you? Good. So glad. Glad to be working with the Dog on 142 volunteers. Um, and uh, yeah, see. So 
excited for for that new construction and and working with those volunteers uh, and Shannon has been amazing so uh, and that will continue to happen just in a in a funky way under construction so a couple of things. Uh, we have Teen Core um, happening this July and August. Uh, Teen Core is a horticulture internship for uh, high schoolers in CB9. Uh, that application is live. Um, you get $1,000 as a stipend at the end of the summer uh, for uh, interning with us, and you would be um, uh, working on a lot of landscaping and horticulture work, as well as learning about environmental justice uh, within uh, the park and um, that's really exciting. So I'm excited to leave that this year. That application is live again for high schoolers in Community Board 9 uh, who live in Community Board 9, excuse me. Um, a couple of stewardship opportunities I want to share with you that are starting this month in April. Um, 143rd Street and Riverside Drive needs a lot of love. There is a, a wild, uh, a for, uh, not a forever wild area, but a, a bit more of a wild landscape there that needs a lot of love. So every second Tuesday, starting March 12th, there'll be a volunteer cleanup uh, in that section. Jenny's Garden on 138th Street. Uh, a lot of people know it's a, it's a vegetable garden. It's a community garden. Um, they are starting to open up uh, in the spring. So if anybody wants to volunteer there, um, those applications won't open until the spring. So I'll come back uh, another month and share about that. And then Sakura Park on 122nd Street. We do have volunteer opportunities there every Wednesday starting April 3rd. So if you or someone you know is inter interested excuse me, in stewardship gardening opportunities. I'll put my email down in the chat and y'all can reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. We're moving right along. Are there questions for yeah. Stephanie Caban? Heather? Very good, Stephanie. And then any um, announcements of things that people have coming up very, very soon, please feel free to put those links also in the chat um, and information. That would be very helpful. Okay, with that said, we're going to Friends of St. Nicholas Park, Karen Asna. I am here and I apologize. I cannot get my video to work. My oh, own. no worries. Sorry no, the, the, the video is just a requirement for CB9 committee members. Yeah, well, I'd like, like to have it, but I can't <laughs> seem to get it fixed. Sorry about that. But I just have a few announcements. <clears throat> I'll try to be brief. Um, we're starting, as I mentioned last time, we're starting to gear up for our the start of our sort of outdoor season. That's really exciting. We're doing a lot of planning. Um, so a few things I want to mention now that are going on. Um, we have a, right now, if people are um, at City College Center for the Arts, one of our group leaders, Adrian Kondratovich, uh, who's an artist, um, and he runs the Trash Project also, who's a partner with us in all our cleanup efforts throughout the year. He has a solo exhibit show at City College, and I'm going to just pop the link in the chat. Um, and I mentioned that because um, several of our, our uh, really committed volunteers Years, um are there's portraits of them in this exhibit so it's really fun and it's really focused on volunteerism and sustainability and so it's a really great exhibit if people get a chance to see it it's free I think it's open during the day so I'm gonna uh, put this hopefully right now into the chat um there you go so that's Thank really you. great and then we have our Easter event coming up on Saturday March the 30th I believe that's the correct date. Um, sorry, just to make sure. Yeah, Saturday the 30th at noon. So as soon as we have the flyer done this week for that, um, I will get that to Yutha and so and we'll publicize and patch and on our social media. But it's a similar event that we've had for the last several years where we have an Easter egg hunt and visit from the Easter Bunny and usually some games or entertainment. Um, so that's always a great event uh, for neighborhood kids. So spread the word on that. Um, <clears throat> and then we're also uh, right now planning for, as I said, for sort of events in the summer, including specifically for live music performances. We've got a, um, a, a small, but you know, better than in years past budget, um, in partnership with uh, West Harlem Development Corporation to do live music and try to um, do more live music in the park, which is exciting because we've tried to do a, a fair bit of that in the past. So if people have uh, ideas of what they'd love to hear, you know, we tend to have focused a lot on jazz, either through City College or 
the Harlem School for the Arts or other performances. But if people have other ideas, please, you know, shoot me an email, throw it in the chat, uh, reach out and let us know either of musicians you love or of types of music you'd love to hear in the park. We'd really love to be impactful and be responsive to what people want to hear. And then, uh, so I think that's it. I apologize, I have to drop off. I'm actually taking a class right now, so I have to pop back into that. But if people have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Karen. You, you, Everyone is doing great. We're still under our five minutes. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have questions for Karen? All right, I'll, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Annette, just, I, I'm sorry, um, forgive me for interrupting. I just want to, um, I noticed someone in the chat, um, Callie from the National Park Service District Supervisor. Sure. Um, I believe this may be your first meeting with us. Can you please just, um, if you're still on, on the Zoom, just, can you just give us a brief introduction of yourself before we, we move forward in the agenda? Is that okay? Hi there. Yeah, that's great. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. There. Good. Yes. Okay, Hi, Callie. I'm going to stay on uh, without my camera because I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> oh, no, um, no, no. That's fine. <laughs> it's it's but, only um, for, for yeah. community board members. But thank you so much for being here. I saw you, you, you put your information in the chat. Wonderful. Yeah, no, thank you so much for um, allowing me to introduce myself. I was recently uh, promoted into the position of the district supervisor for Manhattan Sites, which is a collective of nine national park sites within Manhattan. And two of my sites fall within um, the community board nine. So I thought it would be prudent to hop on tonight and see what's going on with our neighborhood parks. And um, if anybody has any questions or wants to reach out about um, collaborations or different events going on through our sites, I would love to chat with you. And I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat here. Um, but I, this is not the last time you'll see me at these meetings. I'd Thank love to, you so much. Yeah, you, I, I, I'd love I, to did join. You, you received my announcement. I think I connected with you. And, and, and also any volunteer information, um, you know, as the spring is coming forward, we'd like to know about the volunteer opportunities with the National Park Service. Yes, we have tons of volunteer opportunities. Um, Within historical interpretation, um, we have General Grant National Memorial and Hamilton Grange National Memorial um, within this um, district. Um, but then we also have a, a gardening opportunity at Hamilton Grange. We are always looking for folks who want to help beautify the northern section of St. Nicholas Park and um, make Hamilton Grange look spectacular. So as I said, reach out with any questions and I can also send you um, some resources about the volunteer opportunities. Thank you so much. Wow, you were you were on my list to get you to <laughs> one of our meetings this year. So thank you so much for coming. Okay. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and please do put your contact information and we look forward to you joining us in um in on our ongoing meetings for our community district. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Callie. Okay, next up, Brad Taylor, Friends of Morningside Park. Hi, Brad, how are you? Hello, all. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Great, great. It's good to be here. Good to see everyone, Annette, Heather. Uh, it's been great sort of working with you on some of the stuff that we, we've been talking about around the park. Yes, I sent you an email, so we'll we'll chat about when we can make that happen. Uh, yes, I wanted to thank Tapashi also for getting back to us with feedback on that. So uh, thanks all and uh, I'll continue to work with, with all of you as we try to move forward on this. Um, in terms of the Friends of Morningside Park, uh, lots of great news. I mean, we just have volunteer groups uh, approaching us two to three times a day. Everyone wants to come out and work at the park, it seems this spring. So luckily we have the amazing Jill Grossman who's now works for us as our director of communications and community outreach and she's uh, handling all this. And it's been, uh, I, I know Matt, Matt, she's been working closely with Matt on that. So we've got a lot of volunteer stuff happening in the park. Uh, as, as I've uh, said before, we have a regular Friday 
morning uh, group that comes out. So you're welcome to join that from nine to 11. Um, and then this weekend, uh, we have our first second Saturday of the month. Uh, that's a larger community volunteer effort that goes from 10 to 12. So um, you can find out more, of course, at morningsidepark.org. Um, uh, I guess really that's about it. I know there's some super exciting stuff happening that I'm sure we'll hear about from, from Matt and Tapashi. Uh, one, one thing that we've been involved in for the longest time, which is coming to fruition, is the cafe uh, concession um, at 112th Street in Morningside Park. I know a lot of people are super excited about that. Um, and uh, that that is, they've started work on that. Uh, actually, tomorrow evening, I will be attending the CB9 Transportation and Uniform Services Committee uh, Zoom with the concessionaire, uh, Michael Somerville, uh, otherwise known as Crabman Mike, uh, because uh, he will be applying for a liquor license, which goes through that committee. So that's about it. There's a lot going on. Yeah, you guys are busy. Thank you so much, Brad. We'll be Did you want to say anything about the gymnasium marker? or um, well, and, and I want to forward that information that you sent us to the committee members, that the historical information was fantastic. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, there, there is some great historical information out there. And I believe um, one of the spectator reporters who reported on a lot of this stuff and did a great article about the history of the pond uh, is 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 on the call tonight. Uh, Tashai, are you there? Uh, re regardless, um, uh, yeah, please share share that around, Heather. Uh, as far as the marker, as I said, I think um, you, uh, Heather, and Annette, and I need to sort of get together soon um, and, and decide sort of next steps from our end, yeah. Okay, thank you, Brad. Sure, any questions? Great. Okay, so we're gonna move along to New York City Parks. I believe we have Matt. Matt, you're first up, and then there's Tapashi behind you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as Brad uh, mentioned, the construction is underway on the 112th building for the concessionaire. Uh, they're making a priority to get the bathrooms done. So uh, hopefully uh, into spring, beginning of summer, uh, the restrooms will be open back up uh, to the public there uh, as they continue work on the um, their facilities then to uh, actually sell uh, and cook uh, food um, after the, the restrooms have been open. Uh, a few uh, updates, uh, we are, our agency is uh, looking at some uh, public programming so for some family field days uh, in April, um, which uh, as those details, um, as I get flyers for those before our, at our next meeting, I'll share those. And if I get them prior um, to that, um, I'll for sure send them on to the board because um, the events are in mid-April. So there'll be a field day at a Jacob Schiff uh, pl uh, playground on the athletic field there. And uh, just outside of uh, District uh, 9, but not too far away at Frederick John Douglas uh, playground at 104th in Amsterdam. Uh, or excuse me, 102nd in Amsterdam, uh, there's going to be a family field day uh, done through our recreation division um, in April uh, as well. Um, and then um, the 141st Street uh, pipe railing in St. Nicholas Park uh, is finally complete at that entrance there, uh, uh, which was uh, included as um, on top of part of the, the paving work that was done uh this past uh winter um those are uh all the uh, updates i have for now i'll kick it off to uh tapashi um and then after tapashi i just wanted to give a, a shout out um to um uh judy if she could um be able to uh plug the the green market at saint nicholas uh park sure thanks uh matt Tapashi. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll be talking about the the relaunched New York City Great Tree Search. Uh, this is the first one took place in 1985, and we identified 120 trees. Of those trees, only 65 remain. For the second iteration that has been launched in 2023, uh, great trees are defined as those with cultural, historical, and botanical significance, which are support, uh, helping to spread the word, and nominating great trees in your neighborhood. Uh, we can identify the most significant trees and celebrate them and protect them for future generations. Uh, nominations are being collected on a rolling basis with a public announcement in um, 2023 this summer. Um, so I'll put the, the link to the nomination in the chat, but we're looking for representation in um, Community Board 9. So please feel free to go out, look at trees in your neighborhood, in your in our parks, or even on the sidewalks, and please nominate as, as possible. Thank you, Tapashi. Good to see you. Are there questions? Well, okay. And thanks for putting that link in the chat. Thank you. No problem. Matt, you said Judy is available Judy? to speak about the Korean market. Judy, are you there? Yes. Hi. Sorry about my throat. Um, my name is Judy Desiree. I'm the founder of Town Boogie Healthy Project. We are returning for the second year as a farmer's market on Saturdays from June 1st to November 23. So we're getting closer to Thanksgiving this year. Uh, we're from 9 to 3 p.m. Uh, we are collecting clothing also at the market, and we're introducing a kid zone to allow more programming for kids. And um, we give $2 for kids to spend at the market once they do an activity for fruits and vegetables. Um, we're also looking for vendors. So it's exciting the, that we're going to, you know, have more opportunities for vendors, especially we're partnering with um, Harlem Week on August 10th. So we're also highlighting the opportunity to come once to the community or to come many times at the farmer's market. And Judy, I, can you say when that begins again? I'm sorry, I missed that. Sorry, um, that's June 1st. So we're Saturday markets. We are rain and shine market, and we have a uh, and we end on November twenty three, and that would allow people to use their FMNP vouchers before Thanksgiving. We do accept all nutritional benefit programs, and we have a special event working with um, Greater Chamber of Harlem on August tenth. If anyone wants a kind of pop up opportunity at a farmers market. We're accepting applications for both. Okay. And you mentioned you guys mm -hmm. are taking donations for clothes. Is that new only or new when used? And is there any uh, packaging requirement for the donation of the clothes? No, we're just a drop off. You can be used. You can have holes in it. And it will be recycled, it could be new and it gets donated. We just allowing another organization to put a bin at our market and people can drop off in there. They don't take rugs, um, toys, electronics, it's just clothing. You can get a tax write-off, you just have to download it from their website. Okay, thank you so much okay. for sharing that information. Are there more questions, Heather? And and Judy, you presented to um, our committee um, previously, if I recall. So thank you so much for returning. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I see a hand raised from Jackie Robinson Conservancy. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Sonia Simmons. I'm from Jackie Robinson Park Conservancy. I just had a question for Judy. This is a green market or your locally uh, farmer's market? I'm an independently owned market. Um, the Harlem is one of three farmers market and I have a farm stand and CSA program. So we work with um, uh, farmers that have organic practices. And um, we usually have like two main farmers and we, uh, we accept like um, bakers, um, 
honey, whatever you want. I don't know if that helps answer the question. Okay, thank you. But yeah, we're independent, and I can send you the website for more information in the in the chat. Thank you. You're welcome. And to, again, if if you're on the call, please make sure that you have signed into the chat um, with your name, affiliation. And um, email address, too, if you want to be on our mailing list to receive information about future events and our committee me meetings. Okay, thank you, everyone. That does uh, bring to close the agency segment. We do have two presentations. First up is the Harlem Sculpture Gardens exhib Exhibition at Morningside St. Nicholas and Jackie Robinson Parks. Uh, that is Elizabeth Masella and Savannah Bailey McLean. Again, as I noted in an email, uh, please forgive the delay uh, in receiving your agenda. It was not intentional, but we are glad to have you both. And whenever you're ready, please start. Heather, you have the share. I've made... Um... Elizabeth, a co-host, so you should be able to share at this time. I've stopped sharing. Great. I think, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just, I'm going to give a brief in, introduction. I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Savannah to, we'll run through just um, some information and an overview of the various artworks. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I think it's been a little while since I've been here. I'm Elizabeth Masella. I'm the Senior Public Art Coordinator at NYC Parks. I oversee the Art in the Parks program, which permits temporary public art exhibitions citywide. Uh, temporary public art exhibitions are on view for up to one year. Uh, we work with a diverse uh, variety of artists, community groups, um, arts organizations, community organizations um, to present artworks um, in the parks. Uh, we work closely to um, make sure that any artworks installed in the parks will not impact regular park usage, that the exhibitors have insurance, um, that they leave the site in good condition once the exhibition is over. Um, that's in a nutshell. Um, for tonight, we're here to share some information about a, an exhibition called Harlem Sculpture Gardens, which will be coming to uh, three of the historic Harlem parks, Morningside, St. Nicholas, and Jackie Robinson. Um, the artworks will be on view from May to October of this year. Uh, this is presented by the West Harlem, West Harlem Art Fund with the New York Artists' Equity Association. Um, and I will turn it over now to uh, Savannah Bailey McLean, Executive Director and Chief Curator of the West Harlem Art Fund. Um, who has been organizing this exhibition. Um, I should mention it's a multi-artist exhibition, so about seven artworks um, per park. Um, and Savannah, if you want me to just, when you tell want me to go to the next slide, you can just let me know. Um, sure. So we'll start with Morningside here. Okay. Thank Good you, evening. Elizabeth. Welcome, Savannah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to share that we have several artists and um, team members here. So we have Michael Bromley, the Executive Director of New York Artists Equity Association with us this evening. Uh, my assistant, Juan Sanchez. We have artists Peter Miller, Sherwin Banfield, Miguel Otero Fuentes, uh, Margaret Rolick. We have Shannon O'Deans uh, representing uh, Carol Eisner, Ruben Sinha, and Ileana Emilia Garcia also joining us this evening. So I just wanted to let you know several of the artists are here and they signed into the chat. Thank you uh, so starting, much. Yes, yeah, starting with um, uh, all of the exhibitions, Harlem Sculpture Gardens uh, will be the largest outdoor sculpture exhibition in Harlem's history. Uh, in our call to artists, we asked artists to consider, it wasn't required, but to consider West Harlem's cultural, demographic, and natural history. We have several artists uh, in each of the parks. We're starting with Morningside with Margaret Rolick, and you can see her first work. All the details are here, so I will not read the details of each of the works. You can see that for yourself. But we have Mar Margaret Rolick uh, with Stand Up, and her piece deals with social activism 
and a response to racism, gun violence, and global warming, and particularly attention to the Sandy Hook massacre that took place in 2012, but to really bring about conversation to talk about gun violence in the United States. No particular politics, but a general conversation. The next slide, we have Miguel Otero Fuentes with XOXO, hugs and kisses, hugs and kisses. He is a trained architect, self-taught sculptor. This is an interactive installation. It deals with abstract modernism. Uh, it's a, a wonderful piece, kind of a showstopper, as you can see. And um, Miguel is a Brooklyn-based artist. So is uh, Margaret. She is also a Brooklyn-based artist. The next slide, we have Jalika Yancey, Bronx-based artist. Her work, Perched and Knotted, and it's based on Lucy Clifton's Mercy, her book Mercy and dealing with black compositional thought. Really what she's trying to show is a cultural aspect of natural dyeing. She is a natural dye artist as well, fiber artist, and dealing with the roots of that tradition that goes back to Africa, goes to Asia, and trying to connect people with that tradition again in the United States. So it deals with cultural traditions. The next artist is Peter Miller with Tetrahedral Antisphere. He is a uh, licensed architect with his own firm. This piece uh, deals with origami and um, but uh, more artistically about personal memory and identity and how we interplay with that. It's a beautiful piece, I love this piece. Um, the next artist, and I always have a hard time saying his name, Zora Busharishivili. I hope I'm not banging it up that bad. <laughs> uh, it is a hard <laughs> name. <laughs> Uh, Yura has a, Zura has a very interesting story. He is an immigrant to this country from Georgia, the country Georgia. Uh, he wanted to talk about the human spirit. His works deals with these figures, both figurative. He likes to also do works on animals. And it's really, this particular piece deals with the human spirit. You can see the stance of the man and how uh, he is going to uh, deal with whatever comes his way. So it deals with identity. And we feel that that speaks very well to also in Harlem because Harlem is known for a tradition of dealing with identity. Next artist, Carol Diamond and Ben LaRocca, Playmate, freestanding sculpture built on site where they use a lot of found objects um, I would say that the two of them, their practice deals with lyrical abstraction because it's sort of a free flowing sort of installation. Uh, it may have a shape, it, the shape may morph, but it's, uh, and that's why it's called play date. They're interacting with each other, uh, um, kind of inspiring each other to deal with these very, um, colorful, playful type of works. And the last artist in Morningside would be Ruben Sinha. And you can see the dancing spiral figure. It'll be on 120th Street. Um, this deals with expression of movement and ceramic hand building, a lovely piece. So these are the works in Morningside Park. The next one is St. Nicholas Park. And we start off with Musa Hickson. He's an established artist. And this work here is conversation sculpture. As you can see, it's painted steel. There are seats on the inside of it. He deals with repetitive codes in scientific research and structural patterns. He likes to do that and his practice uh, incorporates painting, wrapping, cutting, scoring, weaving, and um, ooh. I'm forgetting, I, my scribble right here is not very good. And um, um, I'm not quite sure what that last word is, but you can get the gist that he deals with a lot of different disciplines 
And it's a, it's a lovely piece, quite beautiful. The next artist is Luke Shoemaker. This is a rendering of Oblique. This piece will be about a thousand, no, 2,500 pounds, excuse me. Uh, Luke is uh, an established um, sculptor. He's a fabricator. In fact, he doesn't like to talk about it very much, but he helps fabricate for Simone Lee, the artist who won the recent Venice Biennale Prize. And uh, he's also very good in working with artists and helping them out. Uh, this is a beautiful minimalist work, as you can see, modern abstraction, and it's going to be pretty much a good showstopper in St. Nicholas Park. Uh, the next work is by Felipe Giacomi and Miss oh, Onepco, and they work together collaboratively. This is the Unbroken Project. It is a fabulous piece. His... Um, Gallery is Throckmorton Fine Arts Gallery in Midtown. And this piece is a photography installation where he uses bullet shells to actually create the figure in the work. And he partnered with a Ukrainian ballerina. And so it deals a little bit with the politics, a little bit, not much, in the Ukraine and about the violence that is taking place in the Ukraine and how they can still find beauty in uh, Ukraine and with the Ukrainian um, people. So Felipe has done uh, a lot of photography work with ballerinas in Ukraine, other indigenous people around the world. And uh, this uh, inspiration was done once before in Paris and now it will be coming to Harlem. The, so it deals with social activism. The next work by Carol Eisner, another established artist, artist, excuse me, represented by her gallery. And it's called Connected with a K. A uh, beautiful piece, as you can see. Uh, it's welded steel and um, it's just quite lovely. Um, Carol has a whole team that will install the work and we believe that people will truly enjoy it. The next work is by Diane Smith, which will be interesting, Echoes of the Path. And this is with aluminum wire and she will strategically place 10 of these small works on the pathway in St. Nicholas Park, um, putting two together at a time. So it'll be like five clusters of these aluminum works, abstract work that will be along the pathway from around 134th Street to 133rd, 132nd Street, kind of encouraging people to engage and walk along the walkway going north. The next work will be by Sherwin Banfield. Yeah! Tribute to cool DJ Red Alert. Uh, Sherwin has done several sculptures that focus on hip hop icons. And this particular icon is from Harlem, DJ Red Alert, who is still on the airways. And so this will have sound connected to it with yeah. DJ Red Alert helping to add sound to this particular installation and powered uh, through solar panels, small solar panel. The next work is by Daria Mori and Cody Human, Ancestral Annual. As you can see, it's another uh, work, Stained Wood. And uh, Dario is an alum of City College. And so he wishes to, con and now lives in East Harlem. And so he's contributing to his community, dealing with art very spiritually. Uh, Dario actually did a lot of research in his family history. Uh, they're of Caribbean origin. And so it deals with symbolisms from Africa and from the Caribbean. Uh, the next piece, the last piece in St. Nicholas will be by Heather Williams. And she is being sponsored by Arcrawl Harlem. Uh, it's called Cecilia and is a part of her Witness series. And Heather is dealing with um, 
the slave trade and the memories of the people who were brought across the transatlantic slave trade and dealing with their memories and how they witness to each other. Those of you who go to church, we, we say that, can I get a witness? Can you bear witness to what I feel, I see, I deal with? So Heather's work will be the last one, figurative, dealing with identity in St. Nicholas Park. Going to Jackie Robinson Park, we have Zora again, and this is called Ram. And one of the reasons it was selected is because of Harlem's pastoral history, how we had lots of estates here like Hamilton Grange. And so Ram would be um, a little bit on the hill at 100, near 145th Street and Jackie Robinson Park dealing with that beautiful pastoral heritage. The next artist across the pathway from him will be Vera Tieno, Gardening Angel. And so she wishes to make this uh, work, um, add to this work, excuse me, flowers that she will actually go to every single week, make sure that they are sustained and they will be coming out of the top portion of this figurative work. The next one by Pedro Villa Alta. I'm, I'm sorry, can I, I apologize to um, interrupt your flow, Savannah, but um, I just want to confirm, we we won't be able to comment on the sculptures in Jackie Robinson, right? Um, right, but well, we're because... sharing with this with you. We've already speak spoken to CB10. Oh, perfect, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. I think it's also helpful just an overview of the full exhibition. Right. Absolutely. And, and so, it's in such close proximity to a lot yeah. of us in CB9. Yes. So Pedro's work, XX, is in tribute of the late Malcolm X. It's a beautiful installation, weighs a thousand pounds. And as you can see, it's a sculptural uh, geometric uh, installation that pays tribute to the late civil rights leader. The next one, we only have two more, Ileana Emilia Garcia, who's also here with us this evening with The Jungle. She is a Dominican artist and uh, she usually uh, plays on the themes of chairs and how they deal with memory and family and culture and tradition. So this is a, a different style for Ileana, much taller, made out of metal, and um, it will be along uh, Bradhurst Avenue in Jackie Robinson Park. Uh, two more, we have Craig Blue, who is doing, and I hope I can say it well this evening, Asase Nikise, Let Us Heal, based on uh, his experience traveling to Africa and to the Caribbean and using these various symbols. It's slightly kinetic, where it will move a bit and uh, it will be near one of the gardens uh, on Bradhurst Avenue. And then the last piece by Michael Post called Wisdom. A uh, beautiful theme for his sculpture talking about uh, how we need to be more reflective and uh, how we need to be more uh, open to different types of elements and uh, I know it has rough edges and we're working with that. So therefore nobody would be able to climb on his installation, but that's all of the installations for Harlem Sculpture Gardens. We are also working on sound art and dance walks as well, but that's a different process altogether, just requires permitting. Okay, thank you, Savannah and Elizabeth, for this presentation. Thank you to the artists that are in the room. All of the works are beautiful, and we look forward to seeing them in our parks. Do we have questions? And artists, please make sure that you've signed into the chat and that you've indicated which park your works will be featured. And I see a hand raised from the Jackie Robinson Park uh, or Jackie yes. Robinson Conservancy again. Uh, yes, I just had a question to Savannah. I know you have a meeting on March 9th and I was trying to be a part of that meeting. Um, 
who selected the, the actual art that was going to uh, to the various parks? Was it just randomly picked or? or no, was nothing there... was randomly picked. There was an open call that was okay. issued in June, publicly made quotes from the borough president and shared in all five boroughs. Okay, this was great. a citywide open call. Then what we did was we received about 25 uh, proposals. We thought we would get more, but we received about 25. We did lose a few because some works, it just was too problematic. And mm -hmm. um, therefore we decided as opposed to eliminating anyone, we would embrace all of the proposals and work with each artist to shore up any installation that needed it some were just perfect as is. When it comes to the curation of the sculptures, I did the mm -hmm. curation in all three parks. And that's based on the geography of the parks, my past knowledge of the parks. In fact, my organization has still been the only organization in Harlem that has presented in all four historic parks simultaneously. I'm also a former member of CB9, chaired three committees, served on the- Oh, I'm, I'm aware of that, Savannah. But <laughs> well, you asked, so I'm answering. So no, please I only asked finish. one question. I didn't ask for your resume, but I, I understand. You don't but have to go- it's not a resume. Me. I'm just answering your question. <laughs> so it's okay. based on knowledge <laughs> and understanding of curation. Thank okay. you, uh, Thank you, Savannah. April, you have questions? Uh, yes. Um, for Luke Schumacher's piece, Oblique, um, was that going to be placed in the middle of the lawn? Did I see that no, correctly? It's okay. not. The GPS location for Luke Schumacher's work is 40.81725 north, negative 73.94906 west. So you can look at the GPS location on your phone. It is not in the center can we just go back on the slide? Can I see it again? Sorry. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I also wanted to mention we discussed this, and I, I don't know if you remember the exhibition with Chloe Bass. Oh, I um, see. Do you remember the exhibition with Chloe Bass a few years ago that was in St. Nicholas Park? Um, there were like the large reflective billboards. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. one of them was placed off to the side, and I think that's what we're looking at um, based on previous experience with that mm -hmm. piece being there and not impacting regular park usage. Perfect. That that works. That's great. Um, and I just wanted to know with um I think it's the yellow piece if you continue to move through the St. Nicholas. Carl Eisner. This yes, one? Carl Eisner, yes. That one. Um I just wanted to know I know that there's some programming there often in the spring and summer with a workout class. I don't that it's not going to impact it, but I just wanted to note that for y'all. I'm aware of all the programming that goes on, the, the yoga, the workouts that go on, the kids that play on the main lawn. We made sure that we would not interfere with any of that programming whatsoever. No, I'm sure you did. And then for the um, piece that's going to be the, the sculpture, uh, I think it's a bust near the um, basketball courts. Yes, one? Heather's piece. Yes. Yes, that it's not um, really by the it's not really by the basketball court. It's kind of hard to say at one forty first street. You know, there's the entrance at one forty first off of mm -hmm. Saint Louis Avenue, and as you go in, the path kind of winds a little bit. It kind of curves. Hers is going to be in that area. It kind of curves. It's kind of a nice spot where she's going to be off and not near any of the activities whatsoever. It's like right. right before the playground, before the right by the, below, comfort, by the comfort station. Yeah, below uh, where Hamilton Grange is. Oh, okay. Perfect. Hamilton Grange is up on the hill, and she's at yeah. the bottom. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you. I, and I still have one question about the Ram on One Forty Fifth Street, Savannah. Can you just tell me where that one is in particular? It's going to be on the slope. I did an uh, installation several years ago in Jackie Robinson Park. In fact, we got good press on that piece where it was on that slope and it was a plane 
It was like a wooden plane. And we had it such where it looked like it was going to take off in flight and people loved it. So with this one, it will be on the on the hill, it will be mounted in the ground, but it's gonna try to make it appear like the, the ram is you know, feeding off the grass in that area. So it deals with that sort of pastoral history of Harlem. So it's Edgecombe Avenue slope going down no, the no, 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 stairs? No, no, not on Edgecombe, Bradhurst, closer to Bradhurst. The slope going to Bradhurst. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank well, you. We have more questions. Yeah, I was curious. I guess this was a parks question. Is the is that lawn still going to be closed off when this is open? Uh, that is a good question. Um, we'll just double check that with the park manager, uh, David Williams, to confirm that. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Savannah, thank you both for this presentation. Extra, extra shout out to the artists. We look forward to seeing all of these beautiful works in our parks. Thanks again. Thank you so much and have a good evening. And, and, and Savannah and Elizabeth, was was there anything that you needed additionally from, the, from CB9? Yes, we would need a letter of support for what we are trying to do for the Parks Department. And is it time sensitive? You would prefer, like um, to have that by when, Savannah? Um, Elizabeth? Uh, whenever you can get it to us, you know, the next couple of weeks. Okay, we'll, we'll take care of that as soon as possible. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. You guys have a good one. Okay. I see a hand raised from Brad Taylor. Go ahead, Brad, with your question. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Savannah and Elizabeth. Uh, this is really a massive uh, show, as, as Savannah uh, pointed out. We've never seen anything like this in the historic Harlem Parks. Yeah, and I, ha I have to thank Savannah also just for being so, or gathering all the artists, um, and then also this presentation. I we I think we got through all of the presentations <laughs> in time. So you uh, did, you, you yeah, did thank you all for, for hanging in there and uh, for your appreciation. I think um, Savannah will follow up with like events and all of that. I think later on, right? Once we get going with that. Thank you, Brad. Great, Great. looking forward to, to the artists also for, for being here. <clears throat> okay. So we're gonna move along. We have Broadway Mall Association. Yeah, hi. Hi, Ian, how are you? Very good, how are you? Good, thank you. Cool. You're up next. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I have to give you, um, let me stop sharing from, let me find Savannah. Did she exit already, Savannah? Yeah, she did. Okay. So is that Ian that you need yes. to? Okay. Sorry Ian about Olson. that. Okay. I'm trying to find your name in the list again. Maybe I've gone. Oh, I see you now. Okay. Okay, Ian, you should be able to share your screen. Thank you so much. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Ian Olson. I'm the director of horticulture at the Broadway Mall Association. Um, we're a small four-person nonprofit that stewards the Broadway malls. Um, I started four months ago, and the my main task is sort of putting in place this project that we're calling the Great Greenway, which is an ecological restoration of the malls. Um, this cover photo is a mock-up done by Future Green Studio, our landscape architect. <laughs> um, this is actually the 83rd Street Mall, but in general, you can see this sort of like, you know, layer of native plants and the overstory. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna give a brief overview of what the malls are, um, if you're not familiar with them. 
and then just talk about the uh, the sort of ambitious restoration project. So the Broadway malls, let me get rid of that. Okay. The Broadway malls are, they're a collection of plant obedience that separate North and Southbound traffic on Broadway. Um, they go from 68th to 168th streets. Uh, Broadway Mall Association, we do the, the medians from 70th to 168th. Um, our work includes everything from seasonal plantings, uh, weekly watering, arboriculture, routine landscape maintenance, and a number of other things. Um, this is a nice aerial photo. I don't, I think this is in the 90s, but it shows, you know, just the scale of the malls. Um, here's a map of exactly where they travel through up to 168th from 60th. So, you know, they go through multiple neighborhoods um, uh, with a lot of different character. Um, and we're, I think this, this restoration plan is going to be, you know, just a kind of a very interesting in that sense. Um, just to give you an idea of the, the size of the malls, the total spatial area is larger than Bryant Park and longer than the High Line. That's five miles um, with 5.7 acres of space in total. And there's scale comparisons. Uh, so it's an overview of the restoration plan we're working on. Back in 2019, in the pre-pandemic era, um, Future Green Studio, who's a landscape architecture, a landscape architect, uh, created what they call the restoration management plan um, that we are, we've just currently begun to execute on two of the malls. Um, plan envisions the ecological redesign. It, it's going to remove plants that were planted um, anywhere from the 19... 19- 70s through the 80s. Um, it's a lot of just English ivy and other just rather boring um, plants with really no ecosystem services. Um, and we'll be replacing it with a dense pile of locally native species, meaning all the plants will be sort of tr our tri-state area local. Um, and this is big. Uh, the redesign will create a more inviting public space on the walls while enhancing the habitat value and ecological services they provide that's absorbing stormwater um, and just a handful of other things attracting wildlife. Uh, this is a side view. So this is the 120th Street Mall. Uh, you can see the pergola and just that, you know, a layer of native plants under there with a sh uh, healthy shrub layer. And uh, we hope to also restore the pergola. I'll get to that later. Uh, why are we transitioning to natives? You know, it's a, it's a trend. It's a, but it's a very good trend. Um, they provide many benefits to people and wildlife while contributing to the health of soil and water. Um, so we've already, we're already doing organic land care on the malls, but with this new planting scheme, uh, just to list these off, we're not going to use any inorganic fertilizer or pesticides. Um, less water use. It'll be the hope is it'll be kind of a very limited watering when these plants are established just because they're accustomed to the environment. Um, supports pollinators and other wildlife. Uh, we're going to take data on that. Promote, promote local biodiversity and establish our na natural heritage. Um, a lot of the populations of the plants are we're planting are in decline. And we're, what we're planting was what was quite likely here before uh, urbanization. So to continue, um, plants will, or the new design will help trap carbon and help protect the urban environment from heat and weather. Uh, it'll be a self-sustaining ecology with reduced maintenance and uh, soil health because of the turnover of dead material going back into the soils. Um, and of course, um, the mixture of colors and textures is great for season public interest. Right now, a lot of the malls are just a, uh, a wall of green, but this is going to add a lot of uh, character and artistic diversity. 
Uh, just really quick, this is just more benefits. So habitat connectivity, there's a lot of parks in the area. Um, the malls are going to be a, kind of a wildlife corridor, uh, better connecting green space throughout the west side, um, Morningside Park, Riverside Park, um, Central Park. Uh, pollution reduction, stormwater retention, enhanced pedestrian comfort from the urban heat island. We're planting more trees, uh, larger shrubs, trying to get more shade on the the end caps in the malls at a seating area, and that will also result in encouraging walkability in the space to look at the plants, read the educational signage we're putting up, and what have you. So this is the this is our one of the study malls, and it's actually the next mall. It's kind of sort of slated for restoration after the first two that we do. But you could see just all that's there is just this layer of English ivy on the ground, uh, the cardboard box, and, you know, uh, a couple of shrubs. So it's really, there's no biodiversity. It's not a healthy ecosystem, and it's not really that interesting to look at. Uh, the pergola on the end is rotting away in a few spots. Um, it's, you know, it's a safety risk at this point, so it's definitely going to get replaced. And you have this sort of empty end bed. It will go into bloom uh, come spring, but we're, it's going to be much better once restored. And you can see, again, just sort of a wall of old green yews and you want them here. Uh, this is 104, 105. Again, in some spots uh, that they've been trampled so heavily or what <laughs> have you, that the ivy's uh, died off and there's really just nothing there. And then, you know, so these posts and chains, this fence here surrounds each mall and you can see the damage here that just kind of look like exhaust pipes coming out of the ground um, with the caps removed. And again, this sort of just wall of green that is unappealing and really has no, has limited ecological value. Um, just an example of what we're doing and that what we'll be doing in, in CB9 on the malls. Um, this is the 83rd mall. So each mall has its own sort of character uh, with the design. This one is part shade to full shade. Uh, we're using larger shrubs, denser planting, sort of creating a woodland landscape uh, in the middle of Broadway, which will be similar to what we're gonna do at um, the 120th Street Mall. And some of these plants will be used there too. So you have Virginia bluebells, sundial lupine, and blue wood aster. Uh, this is the other restoration mall at 164th. Uh, this one, you know, it's sort of a direct contrast. It has an open meadow character with route, rock outcrops. Uh, it's a lot sunnier, so smaller shrubs, more of an open aesthetic. Um, and we'll be reusing these plants again. So you have butterfly milkweed, lance leaf coreopsis, and early gold. Uh, and you can see the color scheme differences. So uh, mall restoration and community board nine. This is what's hopefully coming within the next two years. Uh, we may receive state funding that allows us to perform infrastructure repairs. So on 14 of the malls, um, probably in the 120s, 130s, will be, uh, or not 130s, uh, 140s, repairing the post and chain uh, fence. Um, in addition, we'll use a portion of the funding to begin the plant restoration process and focus on the mall from 120th to 121st. Uh, if state funding is not secured, but we actually just secured it today, so that'll be going forward. Um, yeah, we'll be restoring the mall at 120th. Also, another study mall is at 146th. That will be the one after uh, 120. We have preliminary plans for that already, um, and we hope to have that done by 2026. Um, this is another interesting project that's not really part of the great greenway is that we there's a walk through mall so that's it's like sort of a pocket park um probably perhaps you're familiar with these um they're 
little hockey parks in the middle of Broadway with uh, raised beds. And we're going to be turning that into a pollinator garden this summer. Um, and we're actively recruiting volunteers for that work. We want it to be kind of an ongoing project um, and with an educational component to it. So yeah, there's just some some contacts and a diagram of the mall at uh, 120th. Um, this is just sort of a an overview of what constitutes the the restoration. Um, over 3,000 new ground cover. That's grasses, uh, ferns, and potentially vines. Uh, 30 new shrubs. 425 gallon perennials and um, yeah, three new trees, which is very exciting. And a brand new turtle. Cool. I'm just gonna... um, I do have to mention the public art that we're going to be doing on the malls. Um, Sean Scully is the presenting artist. Uh, just a little background, BMA has been hosting public art installations on the mall since 2012. The exhibits are expected to be installed this coming July. Excuse me. And the locations are 103rd and 117th Street malls. And I think there's one north of there actually too, um, but I get it in here. I can send, uh, I can send that over if you're curious about it, but this is the uh, this is the artwork. Cool. And that is uh, all that I have. Thank you, Ian. I just, I'm curious to know, how do you, does Broadway Mall decide which mall they're doing? Because if I'm understanding this presentation, the mall that's the focus is going to be 120th Street this go round. Is that accurate? Yeah, as of now, I think that's the one we're focused on, but there is, so when the uh, landscape architect did the preliminary thing they selected malls just kind of uh equi almost equidistant from each other going up through the whole thing so right now we're just kind of doing one near the bottom and one near the top so it's 83rd and 164. well i'm partial because i live in the middle and y'all are not doing 135th street so i just want you to keep in mind for the next go okay. round of yeah what was it one uh 146. Yeah. But you're doing 146. Yes. And then, He's doing 146, um, but I'm at 135th. I'm at the beginning of that start. Okay, right after the, the valley? After the train station, yes. yeah. I can see, I'll see if there's anything we have slated for that. Um, And then there's the the Pollinator Mall uh, at 150th that we'll be doing, which is pretty much a full restoration. Now, most folks sit down in those areas, so I'm going to assume when the restoration starts, the whole mall is closed off. There'll be no sitting, correct? Actually, the end caps will probably remain open. Really, the planting is only going to take about a week, and it'll it'll be all in the interior of the mall. So, okay. um, yeah, the, the end caps will remain open. All right. Thank you, Liz. I see I, your hand I, up. Let me let me just ask a quick question, Ian. It's Heather. Can you please um, help us understand what the material will be for the pergola? Yeah, so it is going to be uh, I probably cedar, uh, rot resistant wood. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that yet, but yeah. Okay, go ahead, Liz. Yeah, we definitely want to use rot resistant uh, wood. Um, all the wood pergolas on the malls are going downhill pretty quick yes. and kind of presenting <laughs> a uh, public health issue. You know? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Liz, go ahead. Thanks, Heather. Um, so Ian, thanks for this presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Like Annette, I live in the middle. Um, and um, I guess I would be closest to 146. And the Broadway malls are at least in the middle. I don't know, Annette, what do you think? I, they're beautiful. They I mean, we, have, we have beautiful flowering trees. 
Um, and we have um, tulips and, uh, uh, you know, so I would just say, hopefully you're not gonna be getting rid of any of that. I mean, they're probably not native. Exactly, so it's not a full uh, obsessive native makeover. We're okay. still gonna be doing uh, bulbs, a lot of tulips uh, that'll be, that are gonna start coming up anytime now. Daffodils are already up. Um, and we're keeping like quite a few of the, well, keeping all of the existing trees. What we've removed are um, shrubs that are just invasive, known to be invasive, potentially invasive, or um, unsightly in the sense that they're just not growing right and, you know, not flowering. Um, kind of like the, you want them uh, and use the big green things. I mean, might just cut those back quite a bit too. But we're we're trying to retain quite what's on there. Um, I know there's a lot of yuccas on the walls. We're gonna leave those. Um, yeah. It's really, I think it's more removing ivy, the English ivy. Right, yeah, I know there's a lot of that. And also just congratulations on getting Sean Scully. Um, if Sean is going to be doing some kind of unveiling or he's gonna be on one of the malls at one point, it would be great if you could share that information with us because um, he's Absolutely. a big He's a, I mean, I, I have a friend who's friends with him who has known him since before he was big. And um, so that's, that's just, I mean, there will be people that will come to Broadway malls to see these for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll relay that. Uh, we'll get an opening date out there. Um, I'm not really, <laughs> within the art spectrum, but yeah, I'll, I'll um, yeah, I'll ask. Thank you. I, I would just add to that. I don't think Elizabeth has presented on those pieces yet, which, so she'll be going to the community boards uh, to present on the pieces that are mm -hmm. uh, being installed in the malls, uh, just like uh, what was presented tonight. Call them sculpture gardens? Well, Anytime we have art in our parks or along the malls, uh, we go to the community boards and present. So uh, since that's, uh, you know, not till late midsummer, the installations, uh, Elizabeth will be coming back to have this information, the, all the pieces that are uh, going along the malls presented. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that. Yeah, I mentioned yeah, and, it as just a I, sort of interest piece of interest, but yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, more and to I, it. I think they're also sharing with the arts and culture committee too, as well. Uh, yeah, one of our board members is going to be doing that. Yes. Are there more questions, Heather? No, I don't see any any further questions. Ian, thank you so much for uh, presenting this. We look forward to seeing them more restored with some additional native plants. Well, cool. thank you. It was yeah, a pleasure. Very helpful. Thank you so much for being for your willingness to attend our meeting and present that information. It's very helpful. Of course. And keeping us informed too, as well. Yeah, I'd like to drop in in the future for a, a brief. Yes, yeah. please. Yes. And please yeah. keep us updated. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that, it's especially when um, we, we get to the point where you're completing the West 146 piece. <laughs> because that's close to where I live. Okay. All right, so, so up next, we have Ewan. Is Ewan on with the 2024? I don't see Ewan. And if anyone else is joined, um, please um, make sure that we have your contact information in the chat or in or, or your, at least your name so that we can keep proper um, records of attendance. Heather, Thank do you, you want so to much. just discuss what the conference is, even though Ewan is not here? So people are just aware if they're not familiar. Um, Liz, do you want to? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, it's so this the, Saturday. It's this Saturday. Um, Historic Districts Council 
which is the, the city's citywide advocate. It's the only citywide um, preservation advocate for New York. They are partnering with uh, UN Chen, who runs the West Harlem Community Preservation Organization, to have a, uh, a full day preservation conference um, at City College. It's in the North Academic uh, building. Um, uh, tickets are low to no cost. Um, there will be breakfast, there will be lunch, there will be very interesting panels of which I will be on one of them. Um, <laughs> our former uh, chair, Barry Weinberg, will be a, a moderator of one of the panels. Um, there's going to be a lot of interesting uh, people there. And um, yeah, it, it should be a great day. And it's going to be a rainy day, so don't sit home like, oh, well, it's <laughs> rainy. Like, come over to City <laughs> College. That means you and that, you got to come. I gotta heard come. you. I heard you. <laughs> you keep company. I, I felt the vibe all the way over here. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to move. And, and we did put the registration, the registration link is on the agenda. So please register in advance. Okay, moving to old business, West Harlem Historic District. Is there something to add, although Ewan is not here, Heather or Liz? Um, just that I know Ewan has been communicating with uh, uh, landmarks about where they're at in the process, um, where the city is at in the process of identifying buildings for um, the new historic district. Um, landmarks has identified a very small number of buildings in um, between 135 and 155, the west side of Amsterdam and Riverside Drive um, that they've initially identified. I, I know that UN believes that there's more. I certainly think that there are more, um, but there is no update outside of just ongoing conversations. And um, ideally that the people from Landmarks will join us on Saturday and hear from residents about um, uh, our beautiful community and hopefully a new large historic district. Yeah, it would be nice if they stick to what was given to them, which is everything, right? Yeah, well, it doesn't have to be everything, everything, but it's, um, you know, it's not like, you know, if you think about it's, you know, it's a large portion of our neighborhood, you know, not Columbia right. and not the portion of our neighborhood that was destroyed by Columbia. It's everything else that's yeah. not uh, already historic. And there, there's just... There's so much there, and um, I, it, it is important that, um, you know, people in the community, homeowners, property owners, um, are are more aware of landmarking and, and the benefits. I mean, I, I, I think we all realize as preservationists that uh, landmarking um, does increase some costs, but um, ideally it is... Um, making our neighborhood a little bit more s stable and um, and more valuable for the, the people who live here. It's definitely worth it. It's important. So hopefully that happens for us. And mm -hmm. we thank you for that, Liz. So we're going to move on now. Heather, is Robert Stern on? I don't believe I saw him. And I don't know. I, we don't have anything to add about Mac McGifford Hall. No, but also in reference to both of the historic districts where um, we're, we're seeking um, a positive um, outcome from the Landmarks Preservation Commission, we did request funding for both of those districts um, through the, um, the budgeting process. And... Um, and, and 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 that's it. And I do believe that that um yeah we we requested some additional funding for that. And I think that that was positive. Do you recall, Annette? Yes, it was. It was one mm -hmm. of those things that they are state stated they were working on. So it is definitely in, on their radar. Okay. 
Okay, oh, so right. New Yorkers for parks, resi is somebody is saying something? New Yorkers for parks resolution, we still have some work to do on that. So we'll revisit that. Um, the Montefiore Park Plaza Farmers Market. Did, did we need to do we need to share that the New Yorkers for Parks resolution? Yeah. And do we need to vote? I see a, a raise hand from Judy. There's work that needs to be done. You can share what we have, but it's not complete. So I don't know if you want to share that um, because okay. we're not able to vote. And there are some things we need to add or change. So it's okay. It's in progress. It's okay. Judy, I see your um, hand raised. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, I just have a quick question. So last year around October, I had submitted a park permit to put a farmer's market in that park. And I was told um, it was canceled and withdrawn because the MTA was going to put in an elevator and it would close the park down for two years. So I just wanted to know if you know any status of like how this has changed that the market can be in the plaza. Because I was told the construction, um, because food is around, they don't want to have any liability. So they had declined my request. Um, from my understanding, I am not aware of that work beginning to start. This um, request for the farmer's market was brought because the previous farmer market is not in place. And so uh, Michael De Palma, who is head of Friends for Montefiore, thought that we would like to get this ball rolling by reaching out to Row New York City. Uh, Adam Fields came before us and um, asked if we could possibly reach out to them. And so we created a letter of support for a market. Um, there it has not been one in signed. I don't know if there's a process with that, but we are in support of a farmer's market and Grow New York City uh, has plays a part in that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Heather, I sent, or we're, I don't believe we're going to be able to vote because I don't see Ms. Um, Cartwell on. I sent a revised draft for- I, I have those. I did save both of them and there are still, um, and I think, um, April, you may have sent an, a, a recent change this evening. I don't recall which resolution. Um, Liz sent an addendum mm -hmm. to, to the- Did hers get, get on to the, revi to the revision? Um, it wasn't added, but I did respond to her saying, great, we can add that on. Okay. So then um, do you want to just say then that we'll- add those additional comments and we'll keep working um, offline as a group, um, trying to get the, the resolutions to the point where we all can and agree and agree present. And present at the executive. Okay. So mm -hmm. then we're, we're going to move along. But thanks for all the input. I mean, yeah, every, you know, people were sending the, their suggestions, which is very helpful. Yeah, we um, and we support. still have. Um, let's see. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Annette, okay, so ahead. next we have Coda Alliance, and they're going to be moved uh, into the April agenda because they're they're still attempting to fulfill some of the inquiries. You can share and discuss if you want. Uh, Jana <laughs> also uh, just presented a flyer today to share that there will be an open house at uh, Coda Alliance. Uh, people would just need to register if they would like to attend. Um, let me try to share the Coda one, um, if possible, if we have that up, I don't know. Um, um, Heather, wait, before we go on to that, I see Adam Fields. Has his hands oh, up. Oh, sorry. And, and Judy, and Judy if you know, could. 
if you still have another question, but the two of them can go. Adam? Yes, hi. Um, no, I just wanted to offer that as the co-author co of that original resolution, if there's any input that I can provide into revisions, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you have my email, so please feel free to reach out. Sure, we'll make sure to forward that to you when it's Great. done completely. Thanks. Thank you Thank for you. your support and assistance. Okay, Heather, go ahead. Oh no, I'm 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 good. Just um I don't know if I have let's see. The flyer was sent out earlier today. Um Yuta shared it as a community blast. And in the response to us, Jana sent it to us. That was sent earlier today. Okay. Um, I just want to, as a group, did, did everyone get a chance or did anyone get a chance to look at um, the photos that were sent? Can you all see my screen? This is the Coda Alliance um, where they wanted to build the bulkhead on top of the roof. Can can you see my screen, team? Yep. Annette? Yes, Liz? I can see you. Yes. Okay. So this is the area. And remember, I think a question that Liz had was whether or not that bulkhead could be moved back. Right now, I believe that they're attempting to put the bulkhead in this area right here. And we were asking whether it could be moved back so it would not be visible from the street. Um, there is a concern that if the bulkhead is placed right here, the neighboring property right here where these windows are, their view in, possible, in sunlight would be blocked if the bulkhead is placed here. Um, I don't know what you all think about that. I don't. I. I'll. I can try to pull up the drawing that that they did provide us, and I don't know if you all have had a chance to look at it. Did you receive it? Is Annette? Did you send the drawing that the I architect provided? I sent all provided? of that. I sent the drawings. I sent um, the answers to the inquiries. That email was sent out yesterday to to the group. And um, so, and so this is the second photo that they provided. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, this is this is the roof area. We there were concerns about you know activity on the roof. Um, so I don't know if we just want to have a a brief discussion. Did did anyone did everyone have a chance to look at that? If not, I can bring pull up those discussion those points of discussion. If in if anyone wants me to show it on the screen. Did anyone else have any further input? Because they are requesting a letter and we need to provide them with something. Heather. Go ahead, Liz. Um, Did you get the what, email? What is the white thing next to the current uh, skylight top of the- <laughs> That's the same now. thing. Um, when oh, I did not, I think you're asking the same question that I had. I did not get a chance to respond to the architect and ask that question. Okay. But, and, but what's your thought about that? And I'm, I'm going to try to look for that email I mean, and see if I can share the questions on the screen. Um, and I don't know if you were sad because this this was a major concern for you, and I don't know if you're satisfied with the answer yet, Liz, with whether or not they absolutely have to build the bulkhead in that spot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it shouldn't be our responsibility to figure this out. It should be the architect that tells us, like, is it is it or is it not possible to move it to the other side? That that's all. And I and I do wonder if like it's a good point about um about blocking light and air of the building next door. And I actually wonder um if the city will even allow that. Um because there are 
Yeah, it's and it, it's something that I noticed when I was, you know, when they sent the photographs. I said, "Oh my goodness, that's not." Um, let's see. I'm going to try to pull up there, and I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but we do, um, you know, we 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 really do need to look at these items, and sometimes as a group, it it might be a little easier to do so. I'm going to pull up the drawing um, and maybe someone on the call can help us decipher. So if you're looking, oh, existing fourth floor, existing roof plan. Yeah. Conflict with vent stack. Conflict with bath exhaust. I mean, the unfortunate part about this drawing is the existing roof plan is inaccurate uh, because it does not show the um, what whatever the light well. Um, and if that's the hatch, I don't know, but, oh, there's the access hatches on the other side. No, so it doesn't even show the light well, which was clearly shown in the photo. In the photo. When I got the the photo, I was very confused. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and concerned, before I wasn't as concerned, you know, because, but I'm concerned with the light, with the visibility of the way the windows of the next door um would be blocked by that bulkhead yeah so I'm, I, I i'll bring i'll bring the photo back up if that would be helpful for i people mean this to... is helpful because this plan was not legible in the forward that we received like i couldn't read this the the image was really small yeah, I'll I'll forward the actual um email that we received and then you'll be able to enlarge this on your own screens like I'm able right. to do here. Right. Yeah, no. I, 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 Liz, you have that. I sent that in an email yesterday. I, I know, but it, it's it, teeny it, it's it, teeny. Yeah, I wasn't able to enlarge that in it. I oh, don't know okay. um if yeah, so just, I just now went back to the original email that that I received from the architect because I figured that maybe people would have an issue or or not be able to visually see what was in the email that you sent. And thank you so much for doing that. So it, and it also appears on that the staircase that you know these are bedrooms that they're currently renting out as short term rentals for international stays um and they're going to remove the skylight i understand that part they're they're going to remove the skylight to make way for the stair that leads up to the roof mm -hmm. but i don't think that they've clearly answered the question about the minimum height um for a walkout on the roof and whether or not it could be set back so so that the height does not block the neighboring property's windows. And yeah, he, he's light. suggesting he's suggesting on the on the right hand side of this yeah, document. The minimum steer. Oh, at the top six, the, the language is explaining what will happen if if you move things. Shifting the stair to the roof to the north interior of the wall requires the full demolition of the bathroom and service core at the fourth floor. Oh, I see this right here. Yeah. Well, you you only need the six foot fire access zone. Um, I, that is if you're making changes to the roof and if you're not making any changes you don't need that because it's already grandfathered in but the six foot fire access zone is would be required if you make changes to the roof right now 
it's not required. Um, but again, my concern, um, which I did not have until I actually saw the pictures. So yeah, but is there additional information we require of them since she's not presenting until April? As you had sent your initial inquiries, <laughs> can we add a specific? And if they're not clear, then... This so right now, this these are the skylights, and this is the existing access hatch. So that white bill, that I'll go back to, you want me to stop sharing this and go back to the picture list? No, I, I, I see it. Oh, I, I see. This is looking at the, the, okay. Yeah, I see. I see. That's on the other side. So vent stack. So access hatch should be no, I mean, they can get rid of the access hatch. That's no issue. And then the vent stack, uh, I don't know if they mention it, but from now, now I see what they're showing. There should be no issue with um, shifting it back. Shifting it back what, to what, before the vent the, stack. Yeah, the vent stack needs to be relocated, but that's not, that doesn't seem like a huge issue. Okay. And then I, I think, Annette, the, the question is uh, to the architect, um, um, from a from a zoning perspective, um, yes. there an issue with impeding on someone's on a an adjacent property's light and air, um, in 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 such close proximity. Like I I think there is, but this I mean this would significantly block um at least one um one direction from the people living in the adjacent building and heather isn't that your a similar concern that you sort of had to begin with initially yeah i i didn't have the concern until i saw the pictures <laughs> so um yeah i the, i I think, unfortunately, that is problematic. I'm going to go back to, um, let's see if I can go back to the photographs again. Um, let's see. Because I, it could just be me, you know, but I, I just wanted to share this with the group to see if you're seeing what I see. Um, or maybe I'm missing something. I think when they, their interpretation was they thought that we're concerned about these windows here, you know, and, and, and people from these, now these people, because there's so many windows in the back, any activity on this roof, you're going to hear that activity. So some somebody I think had an issue about noise on the roof, but this is my issue because this is where the the new bulkhead will be in this space right here. And then when I see this, this is um, the next door neighbor's window, and this is probably their living room window because it's in the front. Um, this is Saint Nicholas Avenue right here. If this comes up here it's going to block their front windows it's like looking out your living room window now you're looking at somebody's bulkhead am i misinterpreting this picture no okay and, so then and, where we are is and so this is what the this is the hatch liz is this what you're asking this is what the existing hatch is and this is the existing skylight. So they're gonna eliminate right. the skylights and make this a bulkhead. Yep. And the bulkhead and, is and eliminate this hatch. More space, right? right? 
Yep. So am I misinterpreting? Because, you know, we, we kind of have to look at these and work together on, you know, I don't want to misinterpret. Do you see anything else, Liz, in this picture or, um, and for others? Yeah, yeah. hey, y'all, Tabor. I, um, when they came to present, I don't remember them flagging that they were going to be blocking any windows. They didn't. That's why we asked the question. Oh, I see. They're, I don't, April, it's it's like a basic question we ask if some, yeah. you know, you have to ask how it impacts the neighbors. And then we also ask them, have you notified your neighbors, you know? And so there, they did do invitations to invite people to tour the space. And they do, you know, we requested that they notify the neighboring buildings and 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 to show them that this is what they intend to build. Heather Shannon has his hand raised. Go ahead, Shannon. Hey, Heather, thanks. I don't mean to interrupt. I know you folks have kind of moved into a board member discussion in this phase, but I'm wondering, um, since you have an ongoing relationship and dialogue with the architectural firm and you've got these pictures here, uh, I've seen on past projects I've been a part of, it may be helpful to take the picture that you have right here send it to the architect and ask, ask them to do a mock-up overlay um, to scale of where that bulkhead will exist and in roughly what dimensions so that you can visualize it given the real, um, the roughly real dimension. Well, they have a mock-up and I don't know if they've taken it down now because so they can only example, keep it up for so long. Moving, they added, a, they, did, they did have a mock-up on the roof, an actual mock-up on the roof. But what you're saying is put it on this picture because the picture is yes. what we can actually see from the roof. We were, yes. we were not previously able to see anything from the roof. We could see it from the street, which is why yes. I asked them, please show us pictures from the roof. And this is what we received. Yes, because for so, an example, if I were to say if I again, this is out of my path. But if I were saying I'm proposing moving this fire, this uh, this looks like it's a chimney on the right to the left and you and Liz were like, well, where the hell are you putting it? And I copy mm -hmm. and paste it and moved it over and clicked and says, I'm putting it about here. It would visually support in the real space. I'm just wondering if the architects can kind of sketch in, block in, add some lines, put some dimensions right over top of this picture. Right so on top of here, how for. physically yeah. help from this vantage point, what yes. is it going to look like? What's and so we can like? see if, if it's going to block this person's living room window. I, I would imagine that it would be apparent right away because you're going to lose the buildings that are way off in the distance sure but you're going to have a sense for what that what that window looking across the St. Nick's Ave is going to be looking back at when they look north or or south or whichever orientation they're looking just yeah. a suggestion you know because you've already got scale in this picture that's very helpful now yeah. you just kind of need them to draw in what the changes will look like and they may be able to even rub out the 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 skylights to give you a sense for okay here the skylights removed. Here's the bulkhead put in. This is roughly what it would look like in this real picture. Couldn't hurt them. Right. House. And because all they, you know, they did the mock-up, which, you know, some people that come before us don't do that. But they were asking us to look at the mock-up from the street and to see how visible it was from the street. Sure. But that's not what this next door, what this building is going to see. They're going to see their issue is going to be what they're going to look out at from their living room window. OK. All right. So we'll we'll um, thank you so much. For, does anyone else have any feedback or we'll follow up? Go yeah, ahead, Heather, Liz. I'm mm -hmm. just Googling and it seems like um, you can block your neighbor's uh, windows in New York. Um, you can't punch windows into a wall that abuts your um, a, a neighbor's lot line, but you can block other people's um, windows, it sounds like, in New York, as long as you have separate um, lots, zoned lots. Um, so they they can, by law, do that, it seems like. Judy has her hand raised. Go ahead, Judy. Um, yes, that is correct. However, you have to reinstall a different window. So there's a window requirement when you're going to be put a building next to another. 
so that the windows can change for the blast effect. So they have to change that person's window to allow another building to block their window. There's a special type of window that has to be installed. Hmm. Okay. Well, well I, I know I me personally, it, it happened to me personally where my fourth floor window is now blocked by a bulkhead of my next door neighbor. And I wasn't informed that that was going to happen. So I'm very sensitive to that issue. And had the community board at that time, you know, informed me or said to, you know, the neighbor, did you inform your next door neighbor? Then I could have come before the community board and said, hey, it's blocking my sunlight. What else can be done? So we're asking, you know, at least for con informed consent. Um, okay. Or so acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. Or we can at least say, well, you know, let's limit the size of, of the bulkhead, which we've already suggested in the first meeting, but they're going to come back before us in April. And so, um, we need, and, and I think Shannon raised a very good idea to ask them to mock up that picture. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, attempt to do that. She's uh, usually responds quick. Very, yeah. Very quickly to inquiry. So hopefully we'll be able to get that information and share it with the committee prior to April and be prepared to vote. And so are there any questions or anything we're adding to that? Because although we're in the conference of our homes, it yes, is 30. <laughs> we're almost done. Thanks. Thanks, Annette. <laughs> okay. Um, discussion, discretionary funding deadline, March the 21st. Heather, would you like to add something about that? No. Okay. Heather, I mean, um, Liz. You're the last man up with very heartbreaking news, but I like to end on a positive note. This is not a positive this note. This is not positive <laughs> at all. This is not positive at all. And I don't know. I mean, I know a number of us are already on that, you know, on all these emails about 451 Convent Avenue. So um, just to refresh everyone's memories, um, there is a row house on Convent um, between uh, 149 and 150 on the east side of the block. Um, this building, this row house is one of four. There is an empty lot next to it. Um, the woman who um, owned the building um, lives in Brooklyn. She has essentially abandoned the building for more than a decade. She has been fined multiple times by the city for um, uh, working without a permit and unstable building. Uh, the roof was caving in. And uh, so the update, at least from our from our perspective as a community board, um, we knew that the city had fined her in 2012, or sorry, 2022. Um, and um, they were condemning the building and the building was going to come down. There was a lot of uh, conversation about that. And um, the owner um, got a permit, scaffolding went up. And I think from our perspective, my perspective, um, is that the, the owner was doing um, their due diligence to um, rectify the situation. Um, so apparently that was false. Um, and Signe Mortensen, who is co-chair with Housing Land Use and Zoning with me, she was walking convent. I don't know when it was. Was it the beginning of the week or the end of last week? I don't know. The days blend. But anyway, she saw the demolition crew in front of the building um, asking me what the heck is going on. So um, I wrote a series of emails to uh, DOB, HPD, uh, uh, the council member's office, um, and Landmarks. And um, DOB was pretty short in their response in saying um, that the owner was warned many times 
Um, and it, it was a very short response. So anyway, I, I finally got a response from Landmarks um, because HDC that's holding this conference um, at City College on Saturday had just had a conversation with Landmarks, all of the citywide preservation organizations had a had a conversation with landmarks about the problem of demolition by neglect of land of landmarks properties in New York it's it's you know it doesn't just plague our neighborhood it's it's all over New York and I'm um, trying to come up with ways in which to um alleviate avoid um landmark properties from being demolished so I actually got a very thorough response from Landmarks about what happened. Um, and I don't, I mean, I'll read it if people want me to, to read it. It was um, very disheartening on what had happened. Um, apparently, the, I'm just going back and looking at my email. There were like lawsuits between the homeowner and the city. Um, uh, the city did, um, the the homeowner never actually got a permit um, to do any of the work. And then she had somebody else over there on scaffolding and they weren't the owners of the scaffolding. And um, they were taking down more of the, uh, you know, unpermitted work to take down more of the roof. Um, so I think it was a combination of more unpermitted work. Um, uh, I, apparently a judge ruled in the favor of the city um, and the city's um, engineers deemed the building um, unsafe for um, the public. Um, so the building, I mean, I went, went over there and I saw that the, at least the top story was already coming down. Um, it's, it's a bit of a longer um, description um, I did respond back to landmarks and said, you know, this is the most thorough information, thorough explanation about what happened to this building. And um, I, I said, I, our community board was not aware of lawsuits. I wasn't aware of the lawsuits. I wasn't aware of all of the back and forth that had been going on. Um, and that, you know, landmarks doesn't, typically ever come to any of the community board meetings. Um, whereas the good folks at parks are, are always here. Um, HPD doesn't come, DOB doesn't come. They don't come to any of our meetings. And I think um, we need a means in which to provide additional communication between those agencies and the community board. So issues like this um, are not quite so shocking and that we know what's going on. So that was the last place where I left it. Hopefully someone um, from Landmarks, doubtful DOB or HPD will be at the event on Saturday. But again, I think that's the reason why it's important for all, us to, um, to go to that event and try to engage these agencies um, that this community really cares um, about our community, our buildings, our people, and um, that we want to know what these issues are before um, there's, you know, before it's over with. So yeah, that's my because, yeah, there's some there are some checks and balances that need to be um, in place, accountability, because it sounds to me it doesn't matter. OK, there there are lawsuits and HPD is requiring them to, to do whatever. But at the end of the day it's neglect and the developer or owner is going to win by default because when the place falls apart, it has to come down. And that's what they're painting the long game. And this owner played the long game. And unfortunately for our community, they won because the building is no longer standing. And that's really unfair and irresponsible of the agencies. Um, so I will just say that the last piece of this message from LPC was um, 
said that, uh, I'll just read it. It said, LPC demolition by neglect lawsuit is still active and an inquest hearing is scheduled for later this month for the judge to determine what financial penalty should be imposed against the owner. Um, the owner was repeatedly told that if the building came down, LPC would seek the maximum fair market value, which is what we are seeking. An appraiser has been to the building to prepare an appraisal um, that we will use in the hearing. So um, my other sort of, if we're already gonna lose the building, um, I think this community has shown time and time again that we wanna make something positive. Here's your positive spin, Annette. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, as a community between this committee and housing land use and zoning, um, uh, create a resolution that um, we wanna see that property. And I mentioned earlier that there is a vacant parcel immediately adjacent. So let's write a lose resolution that um that we require whatever goes up either on one parcel or two parcels to be afford to be yes I, I i i saw and that yeah whatever you know income brackets or whatever but um i think if there's anything positive that could come out of it it could be um that it could be real affordable housing that sounds like a plan the hearing is it open to the public or it's just between the two the agencies and the owner. Um, I, I probably just this probably closed. Okay. All right. Well, listen, it never hurts to act. So that aff affordable housing um definitely is something that we need to follow through with with the resolution. Does anyone else have anything to add? Thank you, Liz. Thank you Although so much, I'm Liz, for that. Angry update. and sad, but. It is what it is for now. Anything else, anyone? So, any other concerns? Come to the conference on Saturday. You keep me company. Oh, you! This one is trying to guilt and shame me. I, you winning, <laughs> Shannon? <laughs> you're am. hanging in there with us. You have anything? I am. To add, I, sir? I'm I'm sorry for adding a couple more minutes to this call, but my brain's running in the background. Liz, do you happen to know if Landmarks, as I understand you laid out, if Landmarks is seeking the highest fine possible, what happens to that money? In the yeah. sense that can the community board go to Landmark and the city by extension and go, look, you know, these problems exist all over the city. They happen in certain neighborhoods more frequently than others. They're happening in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood's lost an asset, but Landmark shouldn't be profiting from the financial penalty that's going to be incurred here to go take that revenue and put it someplace else. You know, it's we've got good, things in here very that should be readdressed. Yeah, I mean, I will say that Landmarks is like the smallest agency and has like, I mean, they could use the money, although I agree with you, they shouldn't benefit off of it. Yeah, I don't, I I mean, my assumption is that the property owner doesn't have the money to maintain the building or she would. So whatever fine is imposed on her, the building will go into foreclosure, the bank will foreclose and sell the property. And then that foreclosed sum will be divided up against creditors, including the city. Um, but yeah. it may be owned outright, so there may not be a more mortgage, which would necessitate a foreclosure. I don't know. Right. Remember, that property yeah. was the stepson, so I guess yeah. Yeah. this this owner had multiple proper has multiple properties in decay. Uh, uh, it was uh, yeah. it, it was just a curiosity, you know, this idea of you know if if, if you're going to come into my community and you're going to you know, you're going to act poorly. And then, well, I'm looking at it this way, you know, if, if, if we're writing tickets to speeding in, in this community, I expect that revenue to come back in to improve visibility on the roads and that kind of thing. Don't take our speeding ticket money and go plant flowers in some other community. That doesn't seem right. No, that's um, a great so. point, Shannon. And, I and, agree with yeah. you. And at the same time, landmarks seem to be okay with the demolition of those buildings on, what was it? 142nd street. 
um, because they, we, we, <laughs> so it just seems kind of hypocritical, you know, um, <laughs> oh my God, I'm, 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 welcome to my world. <laughs> and it's like my friends work there. Like people, like there's someone who works at Landmarks who married someone I went to high school with. Like I, yeah. and it's just, it's so, it's so political. <laughs> it's so frustrating. I, you know, go ahead and give give the West Harlem district the designation to protect these buildings. And then you say we're going to, you know, implement the maximum penalty on another property that demolition by like, but you OK a demolition of four other pieces of property. In the same area. OK, okay. <laughs> if there are no more thoughts, is it eight forty five? Yes. Somebody knows the magic word. Can I hear it, please? <laughs> I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All righty. Thank everyone for hanging out with us to the bitter end. I make a motion to continue the meeting. Wait, you thought I know where you work, girl. Don't do that. <laughs> I right. can't with this. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a good Thank you. Day. Good uh, job. Liz, I, I guess I might have to see you on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> good night, Good night, night, night buddy. Good night. Bye, Adam. Y'all have a good one. Heather, we'll talk. Yes. Later. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to. Email. We'll catch up. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. I will.